All right, welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort here this time with the CEO of ServiceNow, Bill McDermott. And back at the NASDAQ. It's been a while since I've done one in this space, but I've had the thrill of the world's opening back up. Uh, so I'm glad to have you. Thanks, Thank Bill. Thank you. Do this in person. I, I always start out these days with the same question, but with a twist, which is uh, today's toughest problem that you're facing. We're in a time where the macro environment is very iffy. Enterprise software, though, has been doing pretty well because businesses are trying to be efficient and transform. What would you say the toughest problem is? Capitalizing on the opportunity. Um, digital transformation is the opportunity of this generation, John. And there's been a lot of macro crosswind conversation, but the opportunity to digitize businesses in every geography, in every industry, for every executive trying to run companies today is the biggest opportunity I've ever seen in my life. So that opportunity is the biggest, the best, and I'm super excited. So as it relates to you know my temperature on are things good or bad, I think things are really good if we stay focused on the prize, which is helping customers help their customer. There's such a difference in enterprise software between a really great point solution and a platform. Yeah. Um, there aren't that many platforms out there where ecosystems are built on top of them where there's this sort of momentum of customer benefit that comes from investing in that platform. At ServiceNow, in the past, you've been one of those best of breed sort of point solutions, and you're moving toward being a platform. Talk about that process, because some start on that path and then fall off. Yeah, it's always been a platform. And the question is, where can that platform go? Mm -hmm. And the big idea at ServiceNow is it is a single threaded platform that not only enables IT to manage the assets, the operations, the security of the business, but it also services the business as it relates to giving the employees a great experience. How do you recruit, hire, onboard, train, manage all the services for your people so they love your company? But John, hang with me for a second. Okay. That same single threaded platform is the same one that also drives the customer experience. So as companies digitize to go direct to their consumer and predictively run these relationships, same platform. And then finally, and this is why it is such a sensation, it's low code. So you can build your own innovation on that same platform. Mm -hmm. And if you think about single threading, the way you run your operations in an enterprise end to end, that's fundamentally a game changer. So Practically speaking, because a lot of people, even in business, even you know, some people in tech, never use ServiceNow broadly, right? How is this different from Workday, right? Which right. is kind of an HR focused platform from uh, what Microsoft does, which is a platform for productivity right. largely. ServiceNow is different in yeah. the type of business problem that it's solving. Well said, John. You have the hyperscalers, Google Cloud, AWS, Microsoft Azure, they're all gonna do fantastic. And those companies also have great consumer businesses. They're fantastic companies. Underneath ServiceNow are those 20th century system of record architectures. You mentioned one, but there are others. Some do finance, some do HR, some do customer. But those systems of record were established in some cases more than 50 years ago. ServiceNow is in between those two worlds. We reside above the system of record and we act as a control tower for digital transformation in sending the workloads to the hyperscalers with great efficiency and scale. The magic of ServiceNow, John, is you can innovate your business without disrupting it. So now you have that single threaded platform with the best user experience in the business serving IT, employee, customer, and obviously 750 million net new apps will be built by business for their own businesses. And that has to happen on a platform that scales like ServiceNow's. A lot of the low hanging fruit in digital transformation has been picked already, I think. And now it seems you've still got a lot of companies that have data in legacy systems, right. it's siloed, and now there's probably less money to get it out, 
<laughs> right? <laughs> so, that, so they got to be really careful about what they get out, right, and what the return on that investment of, of making that data modern is going to be. So, so where does service now play as they're trying to make that calculation? That's really well said because the great prioritization is taking place right now. Which platforms are generational and customers don't want to experiment? So they want to bet on platforms they know are going to be around for the next decade. ServiceNow is one of them. The hyperscalers we talked about. And there's really one other SaaS platform that fits into that category of strategic. So Talking about Salesforce? They're certainly in there. Absolutely. Okay. They're certainly in there um, because they take care of customers. And if you're taking care of customers, that's an important thing to take care of. In fact, you know, we can even team up very well because they do a lot of things on the engagement layer, but after you get a customer, you market them, you upsell, you cross-sell, that's great. But now you gotta service them. And you actually have to deliver the promise of what you said you were gonna do at great precision, do it all predictively, proactively, using the power of AI and so forth. So that's what's so special about ServiceNow. And you can think of it this way. We are a standard in the global 2000. But even where we're heavily penetrated in businesses that really lean on ServiceNow, we're only like 15% penetrated because ServiceNow has built so much innovation into the platform in the categories we just discussed that customers have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. So we have the highest retention rate because customers love the product, and we have the best same account revenue growth of any of the SaaS players because we keep innovating. So I think we're one of those special platforms that's on the short list. And you're absolutely right. The projects that get invested in will have a quick fuse to value. Nobody has the temperament anymore for multi-year projects with kind of like squishy ROI. They want facts. They want return on invested capital. And they want to do it with a platform that's a winner. And that's where we come in. So what do you do with your sales team and with your partner ecosystem, yeah. right, to, to have an advantage in that? environment because a lot of um, organizations are either pulling back on sales, finding their best salespeople harder to retain, and then the partner ecosystem can be a little shaky when the economy is eh. You're on a big point because jobs are big here. You have to have the job generating machine to adequately cover the geographies, the industries, and the personas across an enterprise to fulfill the ambitions of a generational platform like ServiceNow. Our ecosystem is going to hire 250,000 people mm. to focus especially on service now. In 2023 20, or? Next three years. Okay, next three years. Next three years, 250,000. And if you think about that, and the fact that you know, our workforce has doubled in the last two years, you've got a sensational hockey stick going here, and you have to have the human capital to fill it. But here's what we learned, John. We only hire 1% of the applicants that come into ServiceNow. And if you look at the engineering acumen of the people we hire, they're nines and tens. We don't go for sevens and eights. And on a go-to-market side, customer-facing assets, same thing. While others are laying off, holding back on hiring, or kind of deciding how much break they want to go for, we're accelerating. And we're hiring, and we're hiring now. Because we have to capture this market opportunity. Everywhere I go, John, the biggest opportunity for us is awareness. Mm -hmm. Once the C-level decision makers know what we can do and they consider it and they look at it against anything else, we win. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're young. I'm celebrating 10 years this Friday at the New York Stock Exchange um, because that's where we're listed. And we're going to ring the bell in celebration for the Fred Luddy Company. He's done a great job inventing this company, and I think we've done a good job scaling this company, but we have a lot of work to do because there's so much help that our customers need from ServiceNow, and we have to activate everybody to do that. Mm. You ran SAP for quite a while, um, biggest software name in Europe. Right now, especially with the war in Ukraine, there's a lot of uncertainty around the European economy, but you've got experience there. So what's your read on the European economy right. and your approach to it right now? The European economy needs to go for the cloud. If you look on a per capita basis, the United States or the U.S. economy has gone for the cloud much faster than Europe. Europe is doing that now. But Europe has a sensational opportunity to get to the cloud, to take what it's invested in in the past and innovate around it, on top of it, and really drive productivity. 
and they have to drive productivity. You know, I had one consumer products company in Europe that had 16,000 people between the Ukraine and Russia. Now, they're paying them both through the end of the year, both the Ukrainian employees and the Russian employees. They pulled out of Russia, and the Ukrainian employees are operating in bunkers, not too productive. So they've got huge cost issues. We are a deflationary force because we take so much cost out of the equation. The work doesn't go away. So you have to automate. So Europe's got to do that. Has but to. Is, but is Europe doing it? <laughs> yes, they are. Okay. They actually are, John. Um, and, and I actually see very large scale companies turning to service now. You know, we had to get our brand really well known. We're a brand led company and the best brand and the best way to lead it is to have the customers talk about it. And the referenceability of ServiceNow is 100% because you can't find anybody who doesn't love the product. So our whole thing was to get into large scale companies, especially in Germany, France, and the UK, and let them tell our ServiceNow story. And as they do, we're scaling beautifully. In fact, some of our biggest arrangements with customers are actually coming out of Europe. Uh, Asia was also initially yeah. slower to the cloud. Uh, right now, there's a lot of tension between the US and China, as a matter of fact, right now, right now, this week, uh, we've got House Speaker Nancy Pelosi in Taiwan. The Chinese don't like that. Um, is that going to affect business? No, because we're not in China. We really didn't go for... But in Asia writ large? It won't, because Asia needs to innovate. And our biggest opportunity, of course, all the mature markets like Australia and so forth, is already on service now, government, um, uh, private sector, all in on service now. The big opportunity, the new frontier for service now is Japan. This year, we released two major, major releases of software innovation. In September, we released Tokyo. We always name our releases after a city in the world. We go to Tokyo and we've got big plans for Tokyo and big plans to invest heavily in Japan. Japan has not moved to the cloud as fast as it should, as you know. Why? Great. Great engineering, yeah. a lot of on-premise, own data center investment, very heavily invested. And that environment is now so ready for the cloud. And they want to go to the cloud because they want to rethink how they actually operate in a far more agile way. You said it. There's a lot of dislocation with China. There are market challenges. And they have to stand out, world's third largest GDP, and be a global player. And the only way to do that is get the businesses in the cloud, get agility built into these businesses mo business models so they can innovate and not be held down by past IT with all that tech debt that can't get them to the finish line. We're going to help them get there. Uh, we've had here at home in the U.S. a lot of Fed speak this week. Mm. I was talking to uh, San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly this week about the impact of inflation What's your read on, is, does the market have that well considered right now? Has that been digested? Because Daly seems to think the market's factoring in some things that, <laughs> that she, she wouldn't factor in. Well, let's face it, it really does come down to inflation. And if the tightening monetary policy impacts inflation in a way that's super positive and you start to see the inflation rate come down, then the market's got it right because it seems like the market's factoring now, perhaps a little more predictability as it relates to interest rates next year, if not a slight lessening um, on the interest rates. And, and frankly- But she's saying, yeah. we don't see that happening necessarily. She, she, she's obviously in that business, <laughs> so who's, who am I to argue with her? But I can tell you this, I think regardless of what the rate of inflation is, Software is the greatest deflationary force out there. So our prospects to do very well in this market because we have to help our customers automate, get more revenue per employee, and take unnecessary cost out of their business. That is going to happen either way. And frankly, for us as a company, you know, we have $11.5 billion in RPO, you know, remaining performance obligations on the books right now. And we're looking at a company here that's going to be a 16 billion plus revenue company by 2026. And the prospects are just so fantastic. So I think business leaders are not going to wait on interest rates or inflation to determine their outcome. They're going to take matters into their own hands. And that's why I think ServiceNow can really help them out. 
you mentioned more revenue per employee, and that made me think of what Alphabet uh, communicated to its employees a few days ago, saying we're not as efficient as we need to be. Let's get some ideas about how to be more efficient. I found that a little puzzling. Um, does that work? Uh, or is it more of a warning <laughs> that, hey, <laughs> some changes are coming. Well, you can send in some ideas, but whether you send in ideas or not, some changes are coming. Well, I think Alphabet's a great company. And I think Sundar's message really was scarcity brings clarity. And no matter how great a company is or how much a company is growing, once in a while, you just have to take an inventory of things. How's the house doing? You know, are we really investing in the right things? Are we taking the long tails out of the equation and really focusing on the next vectors of growth? Where are we going the next 10, 20 years? And who can argue with that track record? They've done such a great job. What's your process for doing that? Well, we are very steadily focused on innovation. Our number one focus is innovation. But I mean literally. Uh, is there a, a certain cadence along which you say, okay, now we're going to take a step back with the leadership team or whomever and decide, are we putting enough focus on this area? Are we putting too much on that one? A hundred percent, every quarter. And, and we start with innovation. We start with foresight. Where does the customer need us to go? And it's not because you ask them and they give you an answer. You have to do a little dreaming here. Hmm. We have to build products the customer doesn't know they need but once they get them they'll say wow how did i ever live without that so this process of innovation and engineering ideas is something we're really focused on and we do it quarterly at the same time we bring in all the business and all the leaders and we say tell me your plan what's your business where are we going not just today not just this quarter next year give me five years what's the dream if you start with dreams you can sort of move out of the things that are the daily minutia level details that maybe you're spending money on just because you haven't looked at it. Mm. So yes, I think it's very smart. And we do it also to say, let's take an accounting of ourself and our leadership. Are we managing this business with great effectiveness? Okay. Well, we've, we've talked about service now uh, and a broader look at the economy, gotten to know a bit more about that. Now I wanna talk about you and uh, I like to start at the very beginning. So where were you born? Tell me about household, parents, siblings. I was born in Flushing, New York. Um, my mom and dad, absolutely dream parents. Uh, my book, Winner's Dream, I dedicated it to my mom. Everything I was, am, or ever will be, I owe it all to her, and I do. But also a great dad. And my dad worked for Con Edison. He uh, spliced those cables to keep the lights on in places like Times Square. And I'll never forget watching my dad chisel the ice off of his windshield as he went in for the midnight shift to keep New York running. And he's a role model and he's a great coach and a great friend. Mm. And, uh, you know, my grandfather was a pro basketball player, Hall of Fame basketball player. And my dad always reminded me, one's just a great player, but he also coached the teams he played on. And you never see that anymore. Coached so the teams he played he on. He actually coached the teams he played on. So, for example... The greatest big man in that era, this is 1940s now, was George Mikan, also a Hall of Fame player. They called him Mr. Inside, Mr. Outside. George Mikan's first coach was Bobby McDermott, and they played together and won championships together. So he was a player coach that not only played, but also coached and won championships. So it was always about teamwork, and my father put that into me really, really strongly, um, even as I coached with him as I got a little bit older. I'm the oldest of four, mm. and I, I got a couple of brothers and um, a great sister, and I'm very proud of them all. I want to go back to the player-coach thing. Uh, there's that biblical saying, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country. And that's part of what makes a player-coach difficult, right? How do you uh, stay in the fight, but also lead the fight? Did you learn anything about that process from either family lore or directly? I did. I mean, you know, I had a, a business in, uh, in high school, so I was a teenage entrepreneur that actually built a business. I bought it with notes. I had no money. But The deli. Exactly. But I understood that it was always about the customer, but it was always about a great team around you. 
and keeping your employees loyal. In New York, they uh, used to call it silent partners when you had people that work for you that you couldn't trust because <laughs> they were your partners, but it was silent. It wasn't legal. So you had to build loyalty and trust. And it all began with running a great business, but really focusing on that customer and taking better care of them than anyone else. How'd you buy a deli at 16 years old? $5,500 in notes, 7,000 with interest. You had to pay it off in a year or you lose everything. And why? Because nobody else wanted the business. It was just that simple. Yeah, but at 16, how do you even I was think working about there. that? Okay, I was working, working there. there. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Whose so business was it? I had, um, it was called the Amityville Country Delicatessen. Uh -huh. The land's owned by Sunoco, Sunmark Industries. And the business was owned by a private entrepreneur who basically didn't want the deli. He wanted the gas station. So tried to sell it for five times that amount. Nobody wanted it. He figured, give the kid a shot. And I got, <laughs> it, I got it for a price that I could swing. And I figured if all the suppliers could give me the first order on consignment, because I didn't have the money, I would always owe them that principal back when I someday sold the business or changed hands. And I was very committed to staying loyal to them. And I told them, you might even charge me a little too much. It's okay, but I won't shop you. We got a relationship for life. And then ultimately, you know, we built this video game room. I don't know if you remember that, John, the Asteroids and the Pac-Man oh, yeah. team. Uh -huh. But my idea was to get those kids to walk a block and a half past 7-Eleven to my store. And it became a lot easier when I had video games. But the big and the 7 Eleven would only let them in four at a time, right? They let them in four at a time. And I went down there one day. Because? Because they thought, they were, gonna, they, thought they were going to shoplift. Okay. So I, I said to them, don't worry about all that. Come down here with me and let them in my store 40 at a time. You can't shoplift an arcade machine. You got to put the quarters in, you don't get the quarters out. Exactly. <laughs> but also, I let them, you know, hang out at the store, make it your home. And at the end of a long day, one of the young people said to me, Bill, when, you know, we want to have good food, play video games, and be treated well, we come here. And when we want to steal stuff, we go to 7-Eleven. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you get what you invest. If you treat people with dignity and respect, they always give it back to you. And that was kind of our model. How did this not go to your head? It must have. As a 16-year-old kid, you've got your own arcade and food, and it's a spot where everybody wants to hang out. I mean, you can't have always had it all figured out. I mean... promise you, John, it never went to my head because I, every day was a fight for survival. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't make big money in these kinds of businesses. The margins are thin. The rent is high. You've got to service the business and take care of the people. It's not a lot left over. So I traded in three part-time jobs for this one. We did accomplish some things. I talk about that in the book. But believe me, it never went to my head. And I always wanted to get into Manhattan. You know, my dream was to get into one of these high rises in Manhattan and compete in the corporate world and be a leader. Why was that your dream? I looked at people coming in that store with their suit and tie on their way to the train, living a nice life, having a nice home. And I just said, man, I got to get some of that. And I knew that Manhattan was the land of opportunity. And I just really always wanted to be in the corporate environment and really compete. And I got my first job knocking on cold doors in New York City. And it was easily, you know, one of the favorite jobs of my life. I want to I wanna get there, but first I want to talk about the, all those other jobs <laughs> that you worked sure. before the deli. So the paper route, you know, the, the, the waiter, job why were you yeah. working so many jobs well i always wanted to make a living and you know i had um a cross hanging on you know the wall next to my bed where i'd get the dollars and i'd roll it up in a rubber band and once i got enough dollars rolled up in a rubber band i was very happy with everything that dollar could do to buy a little bit of happiness for the people that i loved the most and i realized that you got to work if you want to get ahead in this world so yes I was very fortunate to be a young person. My mom signed me up for the paper route because you, you have to guarantee that you'll pay for those papers. Mm -hmm. They give it to you on consignment, but that was really young. I, um, How young? Oh, gosh. I was about, um, I say, uh, 10 or 11, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, uh, and then, you know, I ended up working every job I could get my hands on, finest supermarket. I mean, I was 15 years old waiting in a line at finest supermarket. And you couldn't even get your working papers until you were 16.
but you know my parents thankfully vouched for me you know it's okay <laughs> he likes to work don't worry about it and uh, I remember like standing on that line all day and then finally getting to the line where you hand in your application and I saw the guy with the green jacket and I'm like he must be in charge so I went and talked to him and I told Mr. Kelly no one will outwork me on that whole line just give me a shot give me a shot and uh, by the time I walked home my phone was ringing him and Mr. Finnegan were on the other end of the line saying we're gonna give this kid a shot and then put him on the phone so I got on the phone and I loved that job and I would have done anything for overtime to make a living so I got another job uh, bussing tables at Amato's Italian restaurant and then I also had the deli as the third job and then in the summer I was working for the town of Amityville to pick up some extra money especially on the weekends you know painting fences cleaning up garbage whatever whatever it took so I loved to work who taught you to deal with people well, there's a, a, I, in yeah. that, there's a lot of, con in each yeah. of these things, there's a lot of convincing, there's a lot of being the exception, there's yeah. a lot of showing passion to put you over the top. Yeah, I have to say, like, I think that the, there's a, an adrenaline level of passion inside me that the good Lord himself gave me, but I looked um, at great role models. You know, my mom was such a great role model. She could talk to anybody about anything. And I watched her. And what was cool about my mom and dad is my mom had me when she was 18 years old. And my dad, like, you know, not even 22. And, or just turned 22, actually. And I just grew up with them. And I was always around adults. And I was always watching the adults and adult conversations. And I was never out of place. I was like that kid that could be around the table and not get lost in the conversation. I mostly listen but I learned a lot. And I think that really gave me an advantage. And then being in businesses where you have to serve the public mm. and you have to show dignity and respect and really sign up for people, that really taught me a lot. And um, I'm blessed, you know. I, I loved what I did and every single job meant something to me and I'm grateful. I think in your book you said that the convenience store, the deli, uh, helped pay for college. Yes. Um, was college a part of your family legacy up to that point? Yeah, um, at that point, I, um, I was the first one to graduate from college, and the deli paid for all of it. But that's what I meant, is, yeah. is what gave you that focus on education as part of that path to the Manhattan High It's a really good question, because I gotta tell you, I was not so sure I wanted to do it. Um, and actually, I was really kinda into the entrepreneur thing, and I didn't know why I had to punch the ticket to go to four years of school, but it was very important to my mom and dad. And uh, I give my dad a lot of credit because I was definitely not completely signed up. And he drove me to school. We waited in line, filled out the application, and I knew it was really important to my parents. And then I was smart enough to know, wait a minute, I could do this school thing on Tuesdays and Thursdays, take all my classes from morning till night, and then still be in the deli all the other days. <laughs> And I figured out a way on the opposite side of the slicer so when the customers came in, my books would be on the counter and nobody ever saw them. So when the customer came in the door, shut the book, go right, take care of the customer. But where I wanted to be was with the customer, not with the books. <laughs> <laughs> Why was college so important to your parents? They knew that in this country, um, education was the gateway to opportunity. And they're, they're right, because I would, probably would have had a, a tougher time in that interview with Emerson Fullwood as a 21-year old aspiring um, person to get that job at a great company like Xerox at that time if I did not have that degree. So I did need that as a calling card if I was going to go corporate. And that's why I did it. Was that partly also about your siblings, right? Because you, you had that entrepreneurial fire. Yes. But you were also the oldest. Yes. And so what you did was probably gonna be some of what they would either think they had to do or at least you're maybe setting the bar. Yeah, I think I, I've always prided myself on my love of family and being a role model to my siblings who I love very much and always try to do the right thing and set an example. And I think that just kind of came natural. I didn't really think it was a big effort, but yes, school was certainly part of it, work was part of it, and then always being faithful and loyal to the family and doing everything you can to help people and do the right thing and always do the right thing. Don't do the wrong thing. 
All right, so college happens, and then you want a job at Xerox. Yeah. How do you get it? Well, that was a real story, because our house had a tendency to flood. So uh, we had a home in Amityville, Long Island, right on the canal off of the Great South Bay, and every time there was a northeast storm, that house would take on some water. And if it rained, and you had a nor'easter and a high tide, it could take on four feet of water. So the day that I was going for my interview, we had one of those high water days. Mm. So I had my $99 suit on from the mall. I got down the stairs to like five steps from the bottom, and my brother carried me to the street to dump me in my dad's car so my pants wouldn't be wet. My dad drove me to the railroad tracks, and we had a really nice conversation. And I just said to my dad, like, I'm so psyched up for this interview. I'm so ready to go. I guarantee you I'm coming home tonight with my employee badge in my pocket. And my dad said, Bill, you're a good guy. Don't put all that pressure on yourself. I said, I guarantee it. I went up that escalator. I got on that train. I read the annual report. This then CEO, David Kearns, reinventing the company on something they called total quality management back then. And I realized that by the time I got to New York City, I realized that the job I was interviewing for was a gateway, but my real dream was to be the next David Kearns. I did not lead with that in the interviewing <laughs> process, but that was the dream. I went through a whole bunch of interviews, and I get um, the hiring center was at top of the sixes, 666 Fifth Avenue, and then the final interview was with the big boss, Emerson Fullwood at 9 West 57th Street. I get there, John, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, look at this building, man. I get up to the 38th floor. I'm in the demo room, waiting outside the receptionist desk on a couch next to David and to Michael, who ended up getting hired later. He could tell a great story. We're sitting next to each other, and I walk over to Joanne Siciliano, who was the receptionist at the time, and I said, Joanne, please give this note to Mr. Forward. I'm not in any rush. I'll be here all day and night. I just want him to know I'm here. She carried it in. Within 30 seconds, I get the call to go meet him. I stare over his shoulder at his office on the 38th floor, 9 West 57, staring at Central Park, and I said, oh, my God. As I went over the hearth of that door, I realized I wasn't going for a job. I was in a fight for my life, because if I could get that job, I would control my destiny. And I knew that was my moment. I had to get that job that day. I knew it. So I sit there. We have a great conversation. At the end of it, he said, Bill, thank you very much. A really enjoyable conversation. The HR department's going to get in touch with you in the next couple of weeks. I said, Mr. Ford, sir, I don't think you completely understand the situation. And he kind of tilts his head. And I said, I haven't broken a promise to my father in 21 years. And I guaranteed him I'd have my employee badge in my pocket tonight. I say nothing. He looks at me again. He said, Bill McDermott, as long as you haven't committed any crimes, you're hired. I said, well, Mr. Fullwood, I certainly haven't committed any crimes. You sure you mean it? He said, yes, I am. So I went over there, kind of where you're sitting. I pick him up, kind of like dance with him a little bit, <laughs> loving. I go to past Joanne Siciliano, go down 38 floors, go to 58th and 6th. There's a place called Bun and Burger. I take the quarters, pluck them into the phone. You had to do that back then call up my mom and dad. I said, mom and dad, I got great news for you. We got the job, break out the Corvell. Now, of course, only people from Long Island, John, would understand that Corvell is Long Island Cristal. <laughs> <laughs> it is. How did you know that wasn't too much? To take on the job or guarantee it? Dancing with the guy. I mean, you came on strong. You've had that sales instinct all along. I can hear that in your story. I just loved him. That could I mean, have gone wrong, though. It, did you read him? No, I just loved him. I did read him, <laughs> and uh, I loved everything about him. And I loved that he gave me a break, that he gave me a shot. So it wasn't like you plan it. You don't hug somebody and plan it out, you know? It was like just two guys realizing something happened. You know, uh, 25 years later, it might have been closer to 30, actually, he said to me, Bill, I want you to come to RIT to give a speech. I said, anything for you, Emerson. I get there to give the speech. And Emerson Fullwood introduces me and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to let you know something. In my 40 year career at Xerox, I only broke company policy once, the day I hired Bill McDermott. And what stunned me about that 
is when he said, I got to get the HR department to call you. I didn't realize for, you know, over two and a half decades that he was actually just telling me what the process was. But I came in there in a fight for my life, and that's why it was all so real, so emotional, so palpable. By the way, every year that I run my CEO event, Emerson Fullwood is with me, hmm. still to this day. And that's what I mean by just really respecting and loving people, especially people that gave you a great chance. You didn't make it to the corner office at Xerox. Why not? Well, I chose to change. I mean, it's not like it wasn't possible. Some people w would even say it should happen. Um, Some people have said that. Yeah, which is really a blessing um, because that's a great company. And at the time I changed, John, I was like a corporate officer, which was a big thing at Xerox. There's all kinds of reasons for that. I won't take you through those details in my mid-30s. And I just said, I got to learn more. I got to do more. If I'm just one company man and that's all I know, I don't know that I'll be a person of the world. I will have had enough experiences and enough things to be the best version of me. So really I changed more than anything else for the education of getting out there and not spending my entire career at one company. Not that there's anything wrong with that. You've it's also just, said you were chafing at the company culture. Well, I think at the time there was some of that, but you know, hey, Cultures evolve, and I always have love for Xerox. I just felt like it was re really more about me and what I felt I needed to do to get better. And I felt that if I stayed there, I was going to stagnate, and I wasn't going to be all I could be. And that was really it. And that's not Xerox's fault. That's just a personal decision. And, you know, I got love in my heart for every single person I ever work with there, and they all know it because I still stay in touch with so many of them to this day. Tell me about Siebel Systems. Uh, you were there for a period before Oracle bought them out. Yeah. Um, I was just talking to Tom the other day. Yeah. Uh, heady times, right, in enterprise software yeah. when um, applications and certain specific types of applications were trying to be really important in, in where business productivity was heading. Tom did a great job inventing Siebel Systems. He had an idea for customer relationship management. Other people might have had some ideas about it too, but he's the only one that built an entire company on it. And it was uh, really an honor to work at Siebel Systems because they were the CRM king of the world. And I got a lot of learning from that. Don't forget, that was my break into software. That was my break into enterprise software. And certainly the systems and the sales processes at Siebel were world class. And it was just a great experience. Now, interestingly, when I was talking to Tom recently, he was, we were talking about this Forrester report. Yeah. I'm going to connect some dots here. Sure. Forrester competes with Gartner. Uh-huh. You were heading Gartner for a while. Yeah. This is interesting to me because these are the organizations that are often used to spell out data points to make the case for why this technology is better than that technology. Uh -huh. If I have to hear about another magic quadrant, right? <laughs> so what did you learn running Gartner right. that you use in your messaging and your sales approach today? One of the things I changed for when I left Xerox was Gartner. Mm -hmm. And Gartner was the voice of IT. And I really wanted to get deeply ingrained in information technology and really understand at a broad level the digital technologies that would shape the future. And that was prescient because had I not done that, I would have not had the appreciation for Siebel because at the time CRM was one of the categories that Gartner covered mm -hmm. and Siebel Systems was the CRM market leader. And I got very passionate about getting back into a large corporate environment where I could use my skills that I had developed at Xerox and then scale them for Siebel Systems. So Gartner was the gateway that gave me the education in IT, broadened my horizons. I learned a lot about CRM by being at Gartner and I went with the market leader. I always said to people, John, in my career, you only get one last name, put it next to a great brand. And I've been very blessed to put my name next to some of the greatest brands of all time. And hopefully those brands felt like I brought something to the equation 
and you know, together it's made a magical career. You've talked about how at SAP later on, you had to present information differently <laughs> to different yeah. cultural audiences. Yeah. You know, Germans known for the trains running on time and kind of an engineering mindset, want the facts first. Maybe right. Americans were more into make me feel like I want to hear this yeah. first. Um, where did you, at what point did you learn that sort of calibration? Maybe it's the same kind of calibration that lets you know you could hug the hiring manager yeah. at Xerox. Well, that's the whole thing. People. I mean, it's all about people and having the instinct and the EQ to understand what the room is telling you. The room is always talking to you. So many people get so confused because they go in there with their preconceived notion of what the meeting's gonna be like or the conversation's gonna be like. You should prepare, but you always have to acknowledge that once you make contact with the room, the room's now telling you everything you need to know about what to do next. And that's what I was pretty good at. So as it relates to SAP, I wanna thank SAP very much because I was the first American to ever rise to become the CEO of SAP. I spent 17 years there, 10 as CEO, and it was a wonderful experience, and it was an honor to have played that role for SAP and hopefully bring a lot of value to SAP. But here was the difference. SAP is a great global brand, and we got a lot of insight on the world and how the world operates, and running one of the biggest companies with one of the biggest systems architectures in the world was really fascinating. Not only the geographic idea of it, but every industry mm. and knowing the C-suite across every industry. But with regard to the information you're looking for, in America, you would tend to lean on the positives of what we're doing right and then get to the root cause analysis on the one or two things that you got to clean up to be the best you can be. In Germany, you would never get to those one or two things that, you know, or, or the five things that you, you were doing right if you didn't bleed out the one or two things that you were doing wrong. So it was very much about, you know, not being too positive, getting very focused on problem management, root cause analysis, countermeasures, really eliciting all the help of the colleagues to help you solve problems. Mm -hmm. Then you could talk about you know, what you're doing to change the world. But all that was good. And the other thing that was really great about SAP, the employee representatives represent half the boardroom. So you had external directors and employee representatives running the board. And then you as the CEO were running the management team. And it's an incredible process because you really have to understand the employees at a very deep emotional level, not just at a tactical level, to get everything moving with great momentum in your favor. Some people want to do that with boards in the U.S. You think that should happen? Um, I don't. I think that um, a good CEO can figure out the pulse of the people without building that extra structure into it. I think external directors and management teams should run the company. I think that if you don't solve the problems for the people and inspire the people and give them an uncommonly good experience, you won't be successful anyway. But adding another layer of management to it, I don't think helps. I think it slows the company down. And I do believe that speed is the greatest asset in business. And anything that slows it down is probably not helpful. Interesting. Now, you talked about reading the room, the importance of that. When was the first big time you misread a room? Ooh, that's an interesting question. I think it was when I did my first big presentation in the boardroom uh, for a CEO at Xerox and it was on a Friday night and I got all geared up for it you know Thursday night hung that suit just right everything ready to go for Friday but by the time I got on stage our business was growing at 50% year over year so obviously on a Friday afternoon at like 4 p.m. the CEO just seeing that was good but I decided to take him through the 25 slides with all the details to show him how good it was. And I walked out of there and I'm looking around the room like, why aren't I feeling the goodness here? You know, where's that karma? And it's like, dude, it's 5 p.m. on a Friday and you're killing them with slides. So I learned like 
understand the audience, understand what's most important to convey, and don't think, you know, tons of detail that you're expected to know needs to be the responsibility of your superiors. They want you to do that. They know you're doing that. Don't overdo it when it comes to communicating everything. Funny thing was, I walk out of that because I didn't feel the good karma. And people told me, like Monday and Tuesday, this is after I beat myself up all weekend, hey, Bill, that was a hell of a presentation. I said, what? That was the worst presentation I ever did in my life. How did you know? Because I didn't feel the karma. I didn't feel the goodness. So I think they were just trying to lift me up. But still to this day, I'll never know if it was a good presentation and it was just too much detail or it was a really bad presentation like I thought it was and I overreacted and probably um, put myself a little bit too much in harm's way in my mind when it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. One of the great lines that somebody gave me once on this, John, was if we ever knew how little they think about us <laughs> when we're not in a room, we'd be embarrassed. So from that moment on, I just kind of got it in my own rhythm not to keep playing Sunday's game, Monday and Tuesday. Sunday's game is over. Now it's time to play a new game on Monday and Tuesday so we win Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So don't overthink it, don't obsess on it is the big learning that I got from that. But I also am hypersensitive now to just get to the point. Hmm. Okay, I, I, I asked this question about what I call Death Valley, a lowest point. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch that up a little bit. Sure. Because a few, seven, I don't remember, eight years ago, you had a tragic accident, glass through the eye, lost your left eye. Right. Don't necessarily want to get into details uh -huh. of how that happened, but how you reacted to yeah. it. Sure. Uh, because here's somebody who has uh, operated in preparation, in passion, in presentation, and here's something that affects, I mean, yeah. not only almost kills you, sure. but also affects yeah. your presentation. Yeah. How hard was that? Well, I, I tell you, the whole thing was, you know, looking back at that incident, you know, the, there's the mind and then there's the will. The mind, when you're in a serious situation, always wants to protect you and it doesn't want you to be in pain. Hmm. And then there's the will that says, this ain't, this ain't your destiny. You gotta find a way to get up, get out, and get on with it. So the first thing I would say is all those things that a person does in their life, all those cold doors you knock on, all those sandwiches you serve, all those young people you made happy, that builds sustenance in your integrity and your character to prepare you for when lightning strikes. Because we're all gonna get hit with thunderbolts. So I just leaned on all the things I was, am, and intend to be as it relates to that incident to get through it. I was worried um, that people would be like, hey, you know, is that our bill? You know, because you really don't know what to expect, um, you know, when glass cuts your eye in half, right? Yeah. Um, but when you go through it, what I learned, John, is first thing I learned is people are so good and they're so empathetic. And actually, when you're not perfect, and something's happened to you that's consequential, it brings people closer to you. Mm. And I didn't know that would happen. I actually had no idea what was gonna happen. Um, but now I communicate with people, whether they know me well or don't know me well, on a whole different level. They tell me their problems. You know, my mom went through this, or my dad went through that, or I hit the other thing. Well, it reminds me of my situation. And we're really human with each other. The other thing I learned is, Vision is not just about what you see. It's what you feel and how you make other people feel. So while I might have technically lost some sight, I gain vision. I see things that I could have never seen before. How did the tragic accident impact that? It made me better. I mean, all of these things all these things that happen to a person in their life can either take you down or make you better, make you stronger, and make you more prepared for the next frontier or the next challenge you're gonna conquer. I can see things today that I could have never seen had I not gone through this. I also see humanity 
with an even greater sense of empathy. You know, my mom and dad put a lot of empathy in us, but even more, because when you live that and the various things that you go through to get back on track, you realize, hey, I'm, I'm, there's nothing compared to what some people have gone through and probably nothing compared to what most people go through. I'm a lucky guy and you got to always remember the blessings that you have, the things that you're grateful for. And I think that I'm where I'm supposed to be. And I think that in many ways, my accident was a force multiplier of empathy for not only me and other people and other people with me, but also an example where thousands of people that work with me between SAP and ServiceNow, you're up to 125,000, say, wow, man, if that guy got back up and he kept coming, so can I. How long did it take you to get to I'm a lucky guy? I was a lucky guy right away. My, yep, in, your, in my mind, John, I, I'm telling it like it is. The only thing I wanted to do was get out of intensive care and get back to work because when I got out of there, the first thing I did is I called my colleagues at SAP in the boardroom and the chairman of the company and I said, because it was a, happened right around a board meeting, I said, I will be there for the next board meeting. How'd this one go? What are we working on? And, and I worked the whole time. And I was at the next board meeting. So I, I, there was never a doubt I was getting back up. I just didn't know, like, how, how you know, how's it all look? You know, how are people going to accept you, et cetera? And, and it's been a blessing. What's, and this is maybe a little bit of a difficult twist, what's the core belief that you got from going through that experience? Because not everybody can get there so quickly. People get hit with a difficult diagnosis, uh, a serious injury, right. something like that. Some people are built where it takes them a while, right? right to, to get to the point of, I can see the positive in this, I can work through this, I can work past this, I can work with this. So um, what is it that you take with you from that experience that you can communicate to other people who might not be built the way that you're built? In my book, I basically start the book with a quote and I end the book with a quote that I think answers the question. Robert Kennedy said, some men see things as they are and say, why? I dream things that never were and say, why not? And I've been put on this planet to find out why not. And why not me, why not us, and if not us, who? So that's the first thing. The second thing is, at the end of the book, it's a very elegant quote, and this was his brother, Ted Kennedy, at one of his toughest moments, and that's why I chose it. In 1976, he lost the nomination um, uh, uh, to be the Democratic candidate. And in his speech, he basically, in his finest moment, which was the most difficult moment of his career, certainly, he said to all those whose cares are our concern, the cause endures, the hope still lives, and the dream will never die. The dreams that I have cannot be taken out by glass. You're going to need something a lot stronger than that. All right. Well, now I want to bring it back around to ServiceNow and how you grow from here uh, toward the targets. I mean, targets three, five years out, 10 years out that you yeah. pretty clearly set uh, in this environment. Uh, what are the sorts of benchmarks that are most important to show in a time of macro uncertainty yeah. to give your employees the confidence, your management team the confidence, investors the confidence that you're gonna get there? Well, first thing is the will. Since we're talking about that will to rise, let's also talk about the will of a great company. I believe in a Japanese saying called dantatsu, better than the best, better than the best we have to be better than the best. What does it take to be better than the best? You got to make great products. You got to tell a great story. You got to provide a great service and you have to build a great team. And it's our job to execute that within our company and broaden that through the ecosystem and do it with great precision and passion each and every day. When you do that, and you have a generational platform like we have. The global economy is your oyster. We got the world by the tail. We just got to go out there and get it. And you have to do that in industries. Like, you, know, you need to know the companies that you serve 
what their customers and their employees are dealing with, and you've got to deliver for them, and you've got to deliver big for them, exceed their expectations. And then the other thing is, we got so much greenfield, so much greenfield. I mean, so many things with so many companies, 1,000 employees, 5,000 employees that are just learning about the power of service now. We want to meet them all. I met one of them today, 500 million company. I met another one, 300 million company. They're like, I had no idea. I'm like, I'm here for you. You know, let's go. Um, so if you do all the right things, in quality they call this in-process measures, then the R measures, which are the results, will take care of themselves. Most companies are so obsessed with the R measures, they forget just because a wind is at your back doesn't make you a well-run business. A well-run business is well-run. It executes no matter what the wind is doing. And when the wind is there, it goes even better. But even in tough times, you get through it. So why did we say 11 billion plus by 2024 and 16 billion plus by 2026? We didn't have to. No one said, get up there on the stage and say that. But that's what we do. We say it because we'll do it. And I think that's an important thing for people to get a handle on a brand-led company with unbelievable passion to win. And that's who we are. And now I've got 20,000 people and an ecosystem of hundreds of thousands more <laughs> that are gonna make me right. We were at a dinner May 31st and you said a line that I'm gonna remember for a while, the only free stimulus left is optimism. Yeah. Where do you go to renew it? You gotta go, first of all, into your mind. The true struggles in life are always in our own mind first. I speak nicely to myself. I'm optimistic with myself. I know that I'm a blessed person and a lucky person. So be grateful for all the things that you have. The second thing you have to do is you have to be brave. There are so many decisions that have to be taken. And I try to start every conversation with yes. Yes, we can do it. Now prove me wrong, tell me why we can't. Not, oh, I don't know, let's go through the slides. And the optimism being the only free stimulus. We have had all kinds of things happen in society for many, many generations. And the one thing that's been perfectly consistent is winners that have dreams, that can renew the spirit and the optimism of the people not only win the crowd, but drive things to places they could have never gone without them. So that's leadership. And that's the profession I chose when I was a young guy. And that's the profession I love to this day. Well, I can tell you love it. Bill McDermott, CEO of ServiceNow, thanks for joining me. For Thank you very much, John. Great to be with you. Thank you.